Great, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Canadian Climate Institute's webinar, Bigger, Cleaner, Smarter and Faster, How to Accelerate the Development of Clean Electricity Projects in Canada. My name is Marisa Beck. I'm the Director of Clean Growth with the Canadian Climate Institute, Canada's leading climate change policy research organization. We produce rigorous research and evidence-based recommendations to inform decision-making about climate change policies in Canada. We are nonpartisan, independently governed, and also a registered charity. I have the great pleasure to lead you through today's session. Ada, I think we're okay to stop screen sharing now. <laughs> Importantly, uh, before we get started, you can choose to follow today's event in either English or French. Uh, pour suivre la discussion d'aujourd'hui en français, voyez appuyer sur le symbole du globe terrestre en bas de votre écran et choisissez l'interprétation française. Merci. As we are opening today's event, I want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that I am living and working and raising my family on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I would encourage all of you who are joining us today to also acknowledge the land from where you are joining us. Our discussion today, uh, you will see at its core is about land and decisions about land use. And to frame this conversation, we want to pay respect to the traditional guardians of the land, their longstanding relationship with the land, we want to recognize their land ownership rights that we will hear a lot more about in today's discussion. I am very pleased to introduce the group of excellent speakers that we will be hearing from uh, in today's webinar, uh, not just yet, but, but very soon. First of all, my colleague from the Canadian Climate Institute, Christiana Gertin, research associate, we have Jesse McCormick, Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Legal Affairs with the First Nations Major Project Coalition. Luis Como is the Co-Executive Director um, for Climate Change and Energy uh, with the Conservation Council of New Brunswick. Rodney Northey is Partner and Certified Specialist for Environmental Law with Gowlings WLG. And finally, Laura Arnold, Vice President for External Affairs, Sustainability and Market Policy with TransAlta. In a few moments, I will invite our speakers uh, to join me here on the screen and to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that are associated with the transformation of Canada's electricity systems to better align with our net zero targets. And what we know for sure is that abundant, affordable, and accessible clean electricity is key to uh, both Canada achieving its, its emission reduction targets at home, but also to really drive Canada's clean growth and international competitiveness in a low carbon global economy. And so what we're really trying to do with this session today is to uh, tease out and to offer some practical solutions uh, to address um, the social and the policy barriers uh, to advancing the transformation of Canada's electricity systems. We also want to identify a set of government policies and legal tools that can be used to drive a faster transformation of Canada's electricity systems. And uh, yeah, well, we have a really outstanding group of, of speakers with us here today who will share their expertise and thoughts on these issues. We are, of course, also really interested in hearing from you who are joining us from, 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 your, from your workplaces or from your home today. This really is an interactive session, and we uh, invite you to engage in the discussion uh, through the Zoom chat box. And, and you can access the Zoom chat um, through the chat symbol, symbol at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, please feel free when you do so to change your name in Zoom to include your organization as well. So to, just to provide a bit more context and we know who, who we are engaging with today. Uh, there will of course be some dedicated time for questions and answers uh, in the latter half of the event, but feel free to put your questions and also share your thoughts and comments in the chat box throughout the session. We're really encouraging a very lively discussion in the chat as well. 
And to get you started to warm up your interactivity muscles and to maybe practice your chat technique a little bit, I'm, I'm inviting you now to share in the chat just one sentence on what you hope to get out of today's webinar. I'll quickly walk you through today's agenda before we get started. Uh, in a moment, I'll be inviting my colleague Christiana to join me here on the screen. And Christiana will share a brief review of uh, the Climate Institute's 2022 report, Bigger, Cleaner, Smarter, um, that discusses the, uh, the transformation of Canadian electricity systems towards a net zero compatible um, compatible um, setup. And, and this presentation will really set the stage for today's discussion. Uh, I will then invite uh, our speakers to join me in a discussion of key questions before we then open it up for questions from all participants. Uh, but for now, over to you, Christiana. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marissa. So hi everyone, um, my name is Christiana Gerton, as Marissa said, I'm a research associate with the Canadian Climate Institute and one of the authors from our recent report, Bigger, Cleaner, Smarter, which I'll uh, get into the details of that just now. So um, as Marissa alluded to, our report, Bigger, Cleaner, Smarter, focuses on the required technical changes to Canadian electricity systems in order to meet Canada's economy-wide net zero targets. And again, we decided to do this project focused on electricity systems because various research and modeling studies have shown that electrification underpins all possible pathways to net zero in Canada. In other words, failing to set up the electricity systems would undermine successfully meeting Canada's net zero targets. So in our report, Bigger, Cleaner and Smarter, we've outlined three technical changes that are necessary in Canada's electricity systems to achieve net, net zero. And the three changes include, one, getting bigger, which in turn means growing the supply of electricity to support increased demand created by widespread electrification. And two, getting cleaner, which involves developing new sources of clean electricity, like solar and wind, and maintaining existing ones like hydro and nuclear, all while phasing out of the polluting sources like unabated fossil generation. And then the third change to Canada's electricity systems is the need for them to become smarter or to become more flexible to balance the variability in supply and demand from variable renewable energy, namely uh, wind and solar. So finally, our analysis has shown that transforming the electricity sector to align with net zero targets is achievable. Many of the key technologies required to make the systems bigger, cleaner, and smarter exist today and are deployable at large scale. With that stated, our report does recognize, recognize that there are some developing technologies that may, may play a role in the transformation. But again, those key and underlining technologies exist today. So overall, in our report, we found that the most significant barriers are not technical, but social and institutional in nature. For example, barriers to permitting and approval processes of clean um, energy projects, regulatory structures and processes, and community acceptance of local renewable energy development. And those barriers bring us to, those barriers, which are just a few, bring us to our discussion today which will focus on how we can overcome those non-technical barriers to accelerate action in this transformation and move faster. So with that said, I'll pass it back to Marissa to kick off the discussion with our panelists. Thank you so much, Christiana, for this really insightful stage setting. And uh, yeah, just before turning to our speakers to get that discussion started, um, I'm seeing that our Zoom chat is still very empty, so maybe people are feeling a bit shy. So um, I'm going to throw in another question to maybe uh, activate some of your, your interactiveness here. Um, so how about this one? Please comment on what do you think is the most critical barrier we need to address to accelerate Canada's clean energy transformation? Christiana, Christiana certainly mentioned a few in her presentation just now, but feel free to share from your own perspective and experiences with us today. Uh, I am now asking all of our speakers uh, to please turn on the cameras and join me on the screen to begin our first round of questions. Great, 
good to see everyone. Um, my first question is actually for Rodney. Um, and, and Rodney, you're working on a, on a scoping paper with the Canadian Climate Institute right now with the title of Framework and Legal Tools for Expediting Clean Electricity Projects in Canada. Can, can you talk a bit more about the two-tracked framework that, that you develop in this paper? How did it come to be and, and what are its most important elements? All right, well, I'll give it a try in a brief amount of time, but it really relates back to the question, the way you put it, of barriers. So a barrier that was well identified and has been identified for years is to clean energy is a siting process and how to expedite the siting of new facilities. And by siting, what I mean is a legal process to get a new site, a new location approved to generate electricity. So if we go back to those goals we were just talking about with Christiana, trying to have clean energy move uh, bigger, getting more supply, cleaner, more clean energy, what I've been focused on then is what kind of siting process could we imagine that could be available for this new kind of technology, the new clean technology. So I focused on siting and the key part to what I am saying is that I think we could consider siting as a two track process. Right now, what typical projects go through, I'll call process one, the first track, the existing track. What I am pro proposing in this paper then is a new second track that I think could be expedited and can apply to specifically to the virtues and benefits of certain kinds of technologies. So what ends up happening in the paper is I try to address together the question of what, how do you have a siting process and how do you have the siting process expedited? So using the idea of an expedited process, the focus or the key I think is trying to identify what is a qualifying technology that's appropriate for an expedited siting. And I'm gonna explain why I say that a technology is the key. So the first is dealing with this, the of a technology focused approach is, if you have a proven technology, meaning and meaning that we know what it will do in the environment, to the environment, what kinds of impacts it has, that is a benefit that we should use to figure out how to expedite. The second is when we have that kind of demonstrated or proven technology, what are we focused on? And what I focus on is those technologies that have demonstrably few offsite impacts and no health impacts. The third thing that I focus on is demonstrably limited zone of offsite impacts. So meaning not a zone that's five kilometers, but preferably a zone of maybe a hundred meters or maybe one kilometer, but certainly demonstrably few. If you have all of those things in play as proven, and let's just take two examples, wind or solar, then I think you are right to consider an expedited second track process. So here's how I put that. If you have that kind of technology that has limited impacts offsite, then you can start to zero on, well, what do you need as your criteria to approve this? And so I say, really, there could be three, as few as three. One, offsite, as I said, a limited zone of offsite impacts and types of impacts. Two, what about onsite? Here, I think we can be very specific very few or no impacts on key ecological features to be defined, but let's just say species at risk habitat would be an example. And third, and I think this is another part that comes from our experience in the last decade or more with siting processes, there's got to be support from a local level of government. But I will say what I'm emphatically saying is local government is not just municipal government, it includes indigenous governments. So if we have a process with a focused technology, focused criteria, then we come up with a process that is rules-based. The criteria need to be very clear and very democratic, if I could put it this way. Anybody should be able to understand whether they have a site that is a qualifying site. And if you have all of that to summarize, you do all that, you should be able to have an expedited approvals process. Thanks. Thanks, Rodney. Um, this is really well explained. So we're looking at expedited processes for specific technologies, proven technologies that meet right. a certain list of criteria. 
Right. And they would then enter a very rules-based process as a means to accelerate just the project rollout and development of clean electricity projects. Um, great, thanks for that. We're gonna, we're gonna turn over to Jesse now, who will speak, Rodney just mentioned it, about indigenous governance and, and participation. So Jesse, I'm gonna turn to you now and uh, have a question for you about indigenous consent and equity that are really crucial first steps uh, to success for clean electricity projects in Canada. So to you, what does meaningful consent and equity look like for clean electricity projects? Well, first, let me say miigwech for, for having me here. Bojo kinawea, bojo indinawe maganadok. Jesse McCormick, Ndishna Kaz, Deshkan Zibin Gonjaba. Minowishigat, Minowawin Nanda, Anishinaabe Gishigat. A quick hello. Uh, I'm Jesse McCormick. I'm from Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, a little west of London, Ontario. Um, I wish you all a very happy Anishinaabe Day, the Anishinaabe Nation, in celebration of the uh, consecration of our uh, Chinook back in 2012, has declared today Anishinaabe Day. So we're celebrating a, a special day for Anishinaabe peoples, particularly in the, in the Ontario area. And uh, also uh, express my, my my thanks to all of you and acknowledge the territory. I'm, I'm joining you from Sukwetmukulu, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Sukwetmuk people uh, just outside Kamloops, British Columbia. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate today. I'm from the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, where I serve as the Senior Vice President of Research, Innovation, and Legal Affairs. So we're working hard on a lot of these issues, and it's really a pleasure to be part of this conversation and to see all of you today. There, uh, there was a really powerful statement from a gentleman named Mark Trahant. Uh, we host a conference every year in April, and I invite you all to join us, and um, this year it'll be in Toronto. And Mark is the editor at Indian Country Today, and he joined us at our conference last year in Vancouver, and he said, the only road to net zero runs through Indigenous lands. And if we stop and look at the map of the country, and we think to ourselves, we've got to get bigger, we've got to get smarter, we've got to get faster, we need to think about how do we involve Indigenous peoples in those processes, and, and, and cleaner as well. And you'd mentioned two of the most important pieces, which are our consent and equity. Consent, um, as many of you may know, um, is grounded in the understanding of Indigenous rights that provides a, a land-based rights and, and um, has been acknowledged in various frameworks, Aboriginal title, but is also in the growing implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the free prior and informed consent. And that's a legal concept that's developing in its application here in Canada. But it's also a very powerful concept in terms of collaboration and the ability to bring people together for the common goal of, of building things out that we need to ensure the electrification of the Canadian system. And why it's powerful is because it achieves the alignment necessary for Indigenous peoples to see benefits from project development, as well as to be confident that the environmental values and cultural and spiritual values associated with the lands on which the buildouts are taking place are being protected. And having consent-based framework allows a certain, sure, a certain certainty with that. And when you achieve that level of certainty, you're also providing certainty for investors, which can help to draw capital into Canada and help to increase the amount of resources we have to complete this build out that we need to do in order to meet our, our 2050 and 2035 goals. And one of the tools that the First Nations Major Projects Coalition has been advocating for since the beginning of our existence is equity participation for First Nations. And that takes the form of opportunities to actually become owners of projects, to, to, to have some skin in the game, to bring some of your own balance sheet to a project's development so that when the project is succeeding, First Nations are succeeding. And that only takes place when you've addressed environmental, social, cultural, spiritual interests and rights. And when you've achieved those things and you've provided an opportunity for First Nations to benefit, benefit you can achieve alignment that, that brings certainty brings project development on an accelerated basis and also advances economic reconciliation. So we're working hard on those things and very excited to, to, to build out on those as we go, but back to you, Marcy. Thanks, Jesse. Um, yeah, so Jesse really emphasized uh, that free prayer and from consent is not just kind of a theoretical legal concept, but can be a really powerful tool to build partnership. And then also the importance of 
equity participation. So indigenous people becoming actually owners of projects uh, to then really share in the benefits of these projects as well. Thank you. Thank you for Jesse for that, Jesse. I'm excited to hear more from you later on. For now, I'm gonna turn to um Louise, actually. Louise, I'd be interested to hear from you about how we can get local buy-in and social license and how we can build solutions to gain community acceptance for renewable energy projects. Thanks for that question. Um, we'll build right off of what Jesse was just talking about. Um, the indigenous model for projects that are succeeding, including one today, we're celebrating the opening of a 42 megawatt birch hill wind energy project that is a First Nations partnership with natural forces in the province um, is, a, is a model that um, I learned through uh, studying failure um, in New Brunswick, uh, what we need to, to actually put in place to succeed. Um, we, well, I was actually personally confronted by my cousin. I'll tell you the story. Um, this is kind of a love story. My cousin challenged me to listen to community members who were opposed to a wind project in northern New Brunswick, um, saying to me, you work on climate change, so you won't care what we think. And I was so stunned by her challenge to me that I decided I would try to understand better why projects fail um, and, and took it on as a research question and said, well, what is this all about? And we spent a year trying to understand where projects succeed and, and where they, they fail. And I must say quite humbly, I learned an awful lot, um, including the fact that um, if we want projects to succeed, we actually maybe want to think about this question of bigger, cleaner, smarter, faster, and look at it and think about whether or not it's primarily an engineering question versus a social question. Um, I actually think it's a social question. I think the engineers will figure it out. Um, and so from a social perspective, what I was stunned to learn from listening to people doing focus groups and surveys, but also an extensive literature review, um, is that social scientists have been studying why renewable energy projects fail for 30 years. <laughs> and I'm kind of upset about not knowing that, um, that we could be taking advantage of a lot of very, very good work. And one of the first things that they challenge us um, and as proponents of projects, uh, we are vulnerable to this. Um, and that is that there's no such thing as nimbyism. That that actually re represents a bias on our part and it's quite pejorative. Um, and that if we actually stand back and listen to what people are saying, we realize a couple of important things. And these were quite well confirmed in our own case studies as well as the research that we did nationally. Um, and that is that what's really underpinning these concerns that, gov uh, that communities are raising, that individuals and communities are raising, um, relate to both procedural and distributional justice. Um, that projects are being announced um, essentially with no community awareness, partly because of competitive processes. And I do think that something around competitive processes needs to be rethought. Um, so projects are basically announced kind of after a power purchase agreement with utilities, so to speak, and consultations are not happening at a level or at a part of the project development phases that allows for co-creation. Um, and Rodney talked in particular about siting, and that is the number one fight um, that often occurs is there's disagreement over the siting. And then that site has been determined without their involvement and there's no flexibility. Um, so those kinds of basic uh, procedural problems where people can't participate, they can't co-create, they can't influence outcomes um, is a fundamental problem. And then the second uh, piece of that is that we end up with some distributional injustice. Landowners may get a lease agreement, but there's no community benefits agreements. We learn there's no national standard or community standard. So what's best practice in community benefits agreements? Um, and so all of these details uh, lead to a spiral of lack of trust, D trust essentially destruction. Um, and um, one of the key things the literature is showing is that there's also an assumption that people will get used to projects. There's always going to be complainers, you know, we'll just build it and they'll get used to it. Actually, they found that's not the case. That if a person feels or a community feels that the project was unjust, uh, to begin with, they may learn to tolerate it, but they're never going to learn to love it. 
And if we do want to build bigger, cleaner, smarter, and faster, we're going to have to slow down. We're going to have to slow down and get people involved um, and get, get these right. Because what happens is project failures teach other communities about how to fail a project. <laughs> right? They're sharing information. They're sharing their experiences. And there's no neutral body to help us um, uh, intervene. So our two big learnings uh, before we get into some of the recommendations um, are that we do need early, sustained, and consistent communication. Changing information, changing the what we're saying, changing the offer on the table leads to uh, mistrust. And that governments and utilities need to do more to provide institutional support through best practice guidelines and evidence-based information um, about renewable uh, energy. So why don't I leave it there, Marissa, and we'll have more to say, I'm sure. Thank you. Great, thank you, Luis. So Luis really, emphasizing here and pointing out the importance of uh, procedural and distributional justice and to really listening to the concerns of local communities um, because otherwise we pay we pay for not doing that with a lack of trust and trust is hard to rebuild over time. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm turning to Laura now with my, my last question for this round of questions. Um, Laura, I'd like to hear from your perspective and experience working with TransAlta. What is the industry's role or what can an industry's role be in um, on how we get projects done faster and, and right? Thanks so much, Marissa. Um, so as Marissa said, I'm with TransAlta. We're an electricity generator based here in Alberta in Canada, but we operate in five Canadian provinces in the US as well as in Western Australia. So we see this question everywhere we operate and everywhere we're looking to, to expand. And so when I think about TransAlta and about the electricity sector, the first piece for me is recognizing what we've already done. So for us as a company, since 2015, we've reduced our GHG emissions by 68%. We're fully off coal here in Canada um, as of 2021. And we'll be fully off coal with our last plant in the US closing in 2025. As a company, we've also continued to grow our renewables footprint. We started there back in the early 1900s and have continued to grow. Um, so since you know 2000, we've grown from 900 megawatts uh, to over 2,900 megawatts of renewable generation. And we're not unique. When you look at our competitors across the country, when you look at crown corporations that operate across Canada, we are all making this transition and a lot of good work has been done. And so I think that's the first part. We're not starting from square one here. We've really made significant changes over the past years. But as we think about what are the challenges facing the sector and the opportunities over the next period, as you heard from my from the other panelists over their answers to their, their, their different questions, it's complicated. Um, it's not easy. There's a lot that we need to work through. But the complication is creating both opportunities and challenges. And together, we need to figure out how we get through those challenges to achieve the opportunities. And the issues are their siting, their permitting, their community involvement, their indigenous involvement and participation. It's about financial supports and making sure we are actually investing in the technologies that are emerging that we need in the system today, that we're investing in new technologies, but also that we're in supporting Indigenous equity participation. And that is a huge one we need to crack and that we continue to see as a company as something that as a country we need to focus on how we unlock better Indigenous and equity participation in projects. For us though, I think the starting point is smarter. And that's really the key part out of the Climate Institute's paper. It's about what we need to actually achieve an affordable, reliable and clean grid. And it's really understanding how all of these different pieces work together to achieve that. And so when we think about the system, we need to understand what the emerging technologies are, what services they actually provide, and what gaps are being left. Because if our system isn't reliable going forward, we're not going to be able to get there. And that's really the first step in our view is we have to have that better understanding of what's being built, what gaps are already starting to emerge for reliability in the systems across the country? And then what technologies do we need to have to come in? And then given those, then what are we building? How are we building them? How are we actually supporting them financially, working with communities, gaining you know, partnerships with indigenous communities or others to actually get them built? 
And so it's really, for us, it goes back to that smarter piece, that that's where we have to unlock to be able to get to the rest of it. And so I think, you know, as we continue the discussion, it's about thinking about how we do that and how we do it together, because none of us can do it alone. Great. Um, yeah, so Laura really emphasizing the importance of smarter and kind of detecting the gaps in the system and where the system needs to be and then uh, thinking thinking in smart ways on how, how to fill these gaps and how to finance uh, the technologies uh, that are needed um, to, to fill these gaps and to, to build a reliable network. And uh, yeah, maybe it's that idea of smarter that can also really kind of transition us into the second round of questions. Um, that I have for you where I wanna focus a bit more on the solutions to the challenges. So we, we've heard about a number of different solutions already uh, from our speakers, um, solutions to address the various challenges and barriers um, that, that they've identified, that we've identified to Canada's electricity transformation. So let's let's dig a little deeper here. I'd be interested to hear from all speakers. We're going to have a kind of a quicker round of, of answers here. Uh, what, what policy levers do we currently have uh, and that are really required to accelerate the transformation of Canada's electricity systems? Um, so focusing in a bit more on what can governments do, what can policy do? And we'll start off here with Jesse. Thank you. Um, I think there's some good work being done, and there's also a lot more good work that could be done to advance some of this. Um, I think there was some positive steps taken in the development of the Federal Impact Assessment Act, and that helped put in place some measures that would enhance cooperation between federal, provincial, territorial, and Indigenous governments, or at least create the tools necessary where that willingness was, was present. There's also some really exciting tools in relation that are being developed directly between proponents, private companies, and Indigenous parties. That knowledge base is continuing to grow, and we're seeing a lot of leadership out of that space. Not necessarily, government is moving along, but in many ways, the leadership, the, the transformational work is taking place directly with industry, with project proponents, with those who are developing and pulling the resources, so the transaltas of the world, the, the others who are trying to, 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 to advance this work. And, and are advocating as strongly as the First Nations Major Projects Coalition for things like the opportunity for equity participation and, and sourcing the, the capital that's necessary to do that. I might uh, quote one of my talented co-panelists here, Mr. Northey, in uh, one component that I think would offer an opportunity for further enhancement, and that's in relation to the Impact Assessment Act. And he was part of an expert panel that was put in place by the Honorable Catherine McKenna when she was Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And Rod, along with a couple others, helped to provide some really insightful policy advice to the Government of Canada that helped to inform the development of the Impact Assessment Act. And I had the, the pleasure of working with Catherine in, 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 the, in her office during that time. But they wrote, if another jurisdiction, such as a provincial government or an Indigenous group, has its own assessment process, agreements could be reached on how these should be coordinated with the federal impact assessment. So the idea of continuing to empower Indigenous participation as Indigenous governing bodies recognizing that Canada is still in this adolescence of, 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 of recognizing Indigenous power, Indigenous jurisdiction, but finding ways to cooperate with the tools we have so that Indigenous voices aren't stakeholders, but actual participants in the regulatory process, so that the views and concerns and confidence that Indigenous peoples can bring to the project development is, is, is put in place from the start. If you're part of the team that looks at a project to assess its benefits, to assess its detriments, to decide on what the mitigation measures should be, that creates an undeniable source of confidence and that can be a foundation for moving things along much more quickly. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Louise, over to you next. I think what we need is um, uh, a neutral agency uh, to be created that can be a source of information that communities that are concerned or trying to learn information about projects and, and technologies can go to. Uh, what we have today is you've got two options. Either you've got information coming to you from the developer, which is often not trusted, um, or groups are going to the last place they can find that were opposed to a project and what their concerns were. So the you know, we don't have neutral fact sheets on, you know, water issues and, and leaking oil from turbines or whatever the concerns are that get raised. Um, we don't have best practice guidelines that are um, essentially, this is what a good 
uh, community benefits agreement looks like, or these are the variations on community benefits agreements that a community can say, oh, what's being offered to us is relative to that best practice, good, better, not so great, that kind of thing. And there's just no kind of best practice uh, guide there, at least that we found that was where what we thought was acceptable. Um, we are creating one now, but I think a better option than an environmental group would be for the federal government to have an office of renewable energy and to be supporting this transition. And then secondly, to tie federal dollars to best practice performance. Um, I really think if we're going to get uh, the transition uh, where we need it to go and clean electricity regulation in place, federal dollars should, should uh, be tied to ensuring that best practice engagement at a community level occurs. Great. Thank you, Louise. Laura, over to you. Policy levers that can be used that are in place already. So I think when we think about it today, you know, there, to Jesse's point, there's a lot of good work that has been done. And two specific ones for us would be on the funding side and then also on the permitting side. So on the funding side, we've seen over the last year or two increased funding support for emerging technologies in the clean electricity sector. We've seen that through direct funding. We've seen that through financing supports through CIB. And we've also seen that through the new tax incentives and new ITCs. So that's really good work that's happened. On the permitting side, we've also seen the commitment in this year's budget to move forward with a review of permitting to determine how we can actually expedite. And on both of the, those fronts, I think the first piece that is very positive to see is the competitiveness challenge we face with the U.S. When you look at a number of those policy levers in both areas, it's competing with that. The U.S. is working actively to address permitting reform. They're also working actively through the IRA to support projects. So that's the first piece is to be competitive. And so I think as a government, the federal government has really worked hard to achieve that. The next piece though is understanding it in the context, of, in the Canadian context and in our market context. And so for that, I think that's where we need to continue to do work to understand how within the clean electricity space, we're supporting different technologies. Are we supporting them equitably so that they're competing against each other or not? And then how are we creating a really predictable and stable funding environment that companies like ours can invest upon. That's one of the challenges we see with some of the funding tools right now is they aren't predictable or stable. There'll be funding one day, it'll be immediately capitalized, the program will be redesigned, and then you'll be able to apply again for some program that may or may not look the same. And so when you look at that type of stability, that impacts us, but it also impacts partners. So when we look at Indigenous equity participation, that same type of instability is impacting those types of partnerships in how those communities can be involved and make plans for the future and their investment opportunities. And so that's a for us a really big piece. And then permitting, as Rod's talked about, huge, and we're really looking forward to how that process moves forward this year. Great. Thank you, Laura, for this. And, and Rodney, over to you. You're still muted. Okay, getting off mute. Um, well, the first point I'm going to try and just address very quickly what role jurisdictions can play. And I guess the big picture, I'm going to make three points. The first point is that I think all jurisdictions have a role in this challenge, federal, provincial, territorial, indigenous, and municipal. The second point is I want to pick up on what Louise and Jesse said, covering sort of different parts of this is, based on recent experience, we have to have an act local framework. There's got to be a framework where local governments, indigenous and municipal, implement a basic framework with local landowners. I think that's the second piece to this. And so then what do you say happens with the upper level governments? In this case, I think you could call upper governments federal, provincial, and territorial. But here what I would like to emphasize is a two-track process with them. I think the federal, provincial, territorials can set the basic rules. But I want to emphasize the word basic. I think they need to provide the basic rules. And I think that Laura made a huge point about funding and I'm not gonna to get to that, I don't have time, but I certainly acknowledge that that has been variable and to the detriment of any longstanding framework uh, for people to work from. But anyway, the federal government and the provinces and territories must set the basic rules and then ensure there are sufficient resources available to the local levels of government to one, apply the basic rules locally. In other words, to adjust them to meet their jurisdictional requirements and then ensure that every site meets required criteria. 
Now I wanna pick up what Jesse said lastly, the Impact Assessment Act. I wanna pick up on it this way. The assessment, Impact Assessment Act, in my view is the, what I'll call the existing tier, the first kind of process for siting that applies really to major projects if you look at the way that act, its project list applies. What the second table or track that I've been talking about are in my so far today is for smaller projects that are below that threshold of major projects, well below that major threshold of major projects, what can we say about smaller projects and get them moving that are more of a local level can be adapted and done more quickly? Thanks. Great. Thank you all for this. Uh, so a lot of uh... Our speakers have shared a lot of interesting and uh, a number of challenges and barriers, as well as some potential solutions. Uh, so I would like to open it up now and kind of use the last chunk of this session for for your questions. So I've seen that participants have been uh, have been busy typing up their questions into the chat box already. So I'm going to uh, forward some of those to our speakers. I'm sorry if we can't get to every single question, um, but yeah, as I mentioned before, please continue using the chat box um, that you can access at the bottom bottom of your Zoom window to send us your questions and we work through as many as we can now. So the first question from our audience to our speakers here, there's uh, there was a question on the relative roles of, of prescriptive policy versus consumer choice when it comes to clean electricity. So, so put another way, how, how can we balance uh, top-down and bottom-up perspectives and actions uh, when we think about how to get projects built faster? Who would like to take a first step at that? I'm happy to jump in. I'll, Go for it, Jesse. I'll pull in and thank you for the question and have been looking at some of the comments in the uh, in the chat. And thank you everyone for putting them in. Um, when we see some of the politics that gets involved in, and can also be an impediment to these build outs, when you have federal and provincial governments in dispute, when you have... Uh, the non-enforcement of federal decisions or, 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 or a misalignment at what Rod had described as those upper government levels, you end up in a spot where projects can be delayed, investments can be held back, um, the work we need to do in order to achieve net zero is, is going to be further, further deferred. And in some ways, there's an opportunity to bring that to the people. So if you put on offer good programs, good policies, good opportunities, regardless of what political voices may, may, may choose to do for political purposes, there's still an opportunity for people to self-select and move towards those things. And I think when I saw the language big switch from the report, it made me think of just transition. It made me think of sustainable jobs. And I think, well, how would the communications team at NR can sell big switch? And it might be a tough one in some parts of the country. But at the end of the day, if there is work that's happening to transition in people's jobs and lives and, and, and modes of securing revenue in their own in their own worlds are going to change, we need to ensure that that support is there. And I think you put the support there and you create that opportunity for bottom up choice for individuals to say, okay, I'm going to take advantage of this program. I'm not going to look to the premier. I'm not going to look to the prime minister. I'm going to, this program's here and it's built the right way. It's going to help me. I'm going to go for it. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to just build the right policy and right supports for people to make their own choices. Thanks, Jesse. Does one of the other speakers want to jump in here as well on this question? Another thought? Louise, yeah? Yeah. Uh, well, just maybe to, to kind of make explicit um, this consideration of scale. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the projects, particularly around this export hydrogen play, these are enormous. These are industrial scale projects. We've got to move away from thinking that these are, you know, <laughs> friendly little turbine here or there. These are huge projects. Um, and I think there's a tolerance for, first of all, in province. Uh, I know from our research, people are less supportive of big projects for export. Interestingly, they raise that on their own. But also, um, people also prefer smaller scale. They're looking at solar. It may not be the biggest, fastest option for people, but I think a mix of, of smaller scale with a larger scale with, with, you know, a householder and a community owned project cooperatives and that kind of thing with the larger uh, private sector projects or utility projects is kind of an important dynamic here um, that we probably want to get that balance right. Great. Thank you. I think I'm going to move on to the next question. We have a long list of questions here. Um, 
So let's talk about status quo bias. Um, so at times deepened by those who may, may lobby against the kind of change and transformation that we've been discussing today. And that is a problem that applies all across all, all the spheres that the panelists have been talking about. So familiar technologies and familiar ways of doing things um, risk um, pre risk to predominate kind of the discussion and the process and slow down things. So what are the most important fronts where we need to get past that status quo bias and, and how can we do that? Laura, I'll, ju yes. I'll jump in and kick this one off. Sure. So, so I think partially it starts with education. Um, because I think sometimes there's there's a bit of a lack of understanding of where we've already come um, and how far we've already come on this and that the transition's already underway. And so we aren't, we're no longer living in a world of solely coal and gas, big turbines, big baseload units in parts of the country. We've moved beyond that and we're already into this. And so I think part of it is, is understanding where we are and also what are the opportunities and challenges that come from that? Um, with the change in the types of technology that, that we have today. And, and it's about, I think, first of all, understanding that, but also then understanding what the new technologies deliver and what they can provide. And, and some of those things, they're different, but there are new benefits that come with them. And so I think in some ways, it's that balance of the two of really getting to that and understanding where we are. And then I think the other side to it as well is, is understanding the limitations. I think sometimes on the other side, we also avoid talking about the limitations of some technologies. And we actually have to have those conversations too, so that we understand the trade-offs, we understand the costs, and we understand the opportunities of where we're going together. Um, because I think that's often the gap is we're kind of missing on both sides. Marissa, if I might just jump in, I think yeah, the go for status it. quo bias, that's really the trajectory or the question that the discussion paper I'm dealing with on siting is coming at. The status quo one might call the existing siting process is the first track that I alluded to that Jesse was alluding to even under the new impact assessment act, but it's really replicated across provincial governments, territorial governments everywhere. So I'll call it the first track. The idea of the second track is not to replace the first track. It's to add and then create a new track that might be uh, more amenable to local control, local decision making, and get more communities involved than just these major projects, et cetera, that have been the typical energy generation projects. So the, the move against that kind of bias is to try and open up some space for some new technologies and different processes that could also have different levels and kinds of engagement and support. Great. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe let's see. Um, another recurring theme that came up in the questions in the chat is, is how we can create the right incentives and openings for different types of technologies. Rodney just <clears throat> alluded to it in his, in his answer just now. So how can we ensure that in solutions like geothermal, hydrogen, ocean energy, nuclear, and behind the meter solutions, um, just to name a few that, that were mentioned in the chat here, that all these technologies really get their chance to compete where they make sense and to really play the role that, that they're supposed to play in, in that transformation. Who would like to take this one? I'm happy to try that one out. Go for it. Um, I think, and this builds off the last question as well, so if we're looking at new types of technologies or the deployment of technologies in places where they haven't previously been deployed, we're looking at a new experience for people, new structures, new, um, we're looking at change essentially. And that requires creating a, a context within which people are ready for change, but also incentivized to see change take place. And if we look at something like small modular reactors and a lot of the work that's happening in the United States, with their accelerated reactor deployment program and the massive investments from the infrastructure or the uh, Interest Reduction Act, uh, Inflation Redu Reduction Act, you're seeing incremental sequential change in a lot of the policy, but also a lot of what's being deployed and being done at a, at a quick pace. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is as we plan out our steps here in Canada, we also need to be planning out the social context, the work we're doing on the ground to educate people, to create space for, for participation, for understanding. So when that siting decision comes, there's support on the ground because the regulatory decision won't ultimately decide it. It will be what people believe in and what they're confident in. And to build off that, 
um, and to touch on something Laura had mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, the, the recent budget and some investments that are being made in relation to Indigenous participation. In order for First Nations to really see the upside in some of these new technologies and, and new build-outs, there really needs to be the, that opportunity to participate as equity partners, which requires the capital necessary to build in. And one of the biggest challenges we've seen for First Nations is access to affordable capital. So that means, you know, if we go to private equity, they'll look at us as concessional because there's a third mouth to feed. How do you find the funds if First Nations don't have it on their own balance sheet to ensure the First Nations can buy in, be supportive, and see a long-term revenue stream? And we've seen some movement from the Government of Canada in Budget 2023 in terms of updating the mandate of the Canadian Infrastructure Bank to permit it to provide support to First Nations. And we're really excited about the idea of a national benefit sharing framework, which is in the mandate letter of the Minister of Natural Resources, which, if properly conceived, could provide opportunities for First Nations across the country and other Indigenous peoples to secure the capital necessary that they need to buy into the projects that we need to build for the transition to net zero. Can I add something? So, oh, sure. um, yes. again, um, I think there's room for dealing with the technologies, and I'll just try and put it in the, the framework I was coming up with uh, of the basic rules being set by upper levels and the, then specifically applied. The way I imagine this could work is that you might have the upper levels of government identify five available technologies or eligible technologies that they're proven that have those limited zones of impact. But then what happens at a community level is an individual community might say, well, we're not interested in all five. We're really interested in two of those. And so we're going to create local processes for our community that it makes two processes eligible to all landowners. Or and another one right beside them might say, well, we'd like a different two. But the idea is to get a basic framework, but also a local level of buy-in. I just want to keep repeating the local buy-in has to happen. Because what we've learned over 10 years of experience, at least in Ontario, is if you lose the local, you then repeal the whole kit and caboodle of what the reform was. So you've got to somehow get a path where one local municipality gets enthusiastic, one First Nation council gets enthusiastic and shows the way for others that may be not so enthusiastic at first, and they start to see the benefits and it expands and it's a domino effect of more and more C advantage, but it's got to have a local level of buy-in, I think, to start and throughout. Thanks. And I think maybe just to jump in on that, it's it's about the technology agnostic approach that allows then communities to participate within that, but also companies and, and others to participate within that. Because if we don't have a technology agnostics view of, of how we're either permitting, how we're, and, and to your points, Rod, not that they have to be the same, but they have to be, we have to recognize the differences between the technologies. But on the funding side, we're not currently seeing a technology agnostic view either. And so if we want communities to be able to have that type of participation of being able to identify technologies they want to see cited, we have to have consistent funding supports um, for different emerging technologies in the system, which we're seeing disparity between that today, between, you know, when you look at the ITCs, differentiated support systems. Um, and so how we actually balance that, how we balance the Indigenous equity component of ITCs with what other companies are eligible as well, isn't currently equitable and, and comparable. And so it doesn't have to be identical. We recognize that technologies are different, but it does have, there has to be an understanding and a consistency across it. Thanks, Laura. I'm mindful of time, but Louise, I want to give you the last opportunity to jump in on this as well, if you have a a quick comment to add here. I did. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just build on Rodney's point to ensure that it was clear the distinction around community support, community engagement. Um, landowner agreements, uh, for example, are quite different than the community benefit agreement. Um, and what we learned was that um, uh, if you just do landowners, you actually create a lot of jealousy in communities. There's a lot that happens there and that you need landowner agreements where projects are cited on private land, but also community benefit agreements. What's going to happen in terms of revenue recycling? And you can see a lot of those ideas played out in some of the Indigenous projects. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear that they're actually two different things and that we need both. Great. Thanks, thanks for clarifying that. So we are almost out of time here. So I'm gonna move us towards 
uh, wrapping up wrapping up this session. If our participants want to get active in the chat one last time here in our last two minutes, I would encourage you to just type down in your view, what is the next critical step to accelerate Canada's electricity system transformation after you've listened to our panelists discussing this topic for the past hour. Um, I also just wanted to identify a few kind of calls to action that really stood out for me from this session. And I think there are three in total. And the first one is really, more focused on kind of the institutional legal setup. So we've heard calls for reform of permitting processes, uh, maybe putting in place a new uh, a new institution, even a neutral institution. We've heard reforms, uh, calls for reforms of funding programs and um, and the and impact assessment act. So kind of that's kind of the formal legal sphere of things. But then what maybe is came across to me as even more important is kind of the social context and creating the right social conditions for getting these projects approved. And here we're talking about true participation, true partnerships with local communities, really listening to concerns, learning together, co-creating projects. So that kind of interpersonal or yeah, social side of things uh, seems to have huge importance based on based on what we heard from our panelists today and related to that, but also distinct in certain ways, the uh, the utmost important of empowering Indigenous participation in these projects, uh, for example, both through equity ownership, so actually financial stakes in the projects, uh, but then also, for example, taking, taking ownership and agency in the regulatory processes, so really um, emphasizing the need for, for building true meaningful partnerships here. Um, those were the, my key takeaways. Um, so, but I just wanted to emphasize as I'm wrapping up this session here that this is really just the beginning. Our conversation today is just the beginning. Um, there will be plenty more opportunities to engage around this topic with the Canadian Climate Institute. The big switch report was mentioned multiple times today. It provides the basis for today's discussion. I would encourage you to visit our website and check that out. We will also soon publish the scoping paper that Rodney was uh, is authoring and was referring to multiple times in his comments comments today. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then my team at the Institute, the Clean Growth Team, will kind of take over the baton a little bit from, from our mitigation team and, and continue research on this issue, looking at accelerating development of clean growth projects more broadly. So stay tuned for all of that. And of course, others in Canada also doing great work in this space. For example, one report that I wanted to mention was Build Things Faster by Electricity Canada. And that addresses very similar themes. So again, something for you to continue your engagement with these issues. In short, it's a dynamic space. The discussion today contributed to that larger continuous conversation that Canada crucially needs to drive electricity system transformation and to ultimately achieve the net zero target. In closing, I want to thank all of our amazing speakers today for so generously sharing their insights with us. Um, thank you all so much. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. And I want to thank you, the participants, for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, and I would also like to thank our organizers at Globe Series for their excellent support and collaboration in setting up this session today. Um, thank you all so much. It's been a great pleasure. And we hope to see you again soon.